welcome to the fifth annual Fairfax County History Convention. My name is Marion Dobbins and I'll be one of the speakers here November 7th, 2009. This year the convention is being held at the James Lee Center. This center was named after my great-great-grandfather James Edward Lee. James Lee was born free in Fauquier County in 1840. He came to Falls Church after the Civil War where he purchased land, he raised his family, and helped to create this community called The Hill. Upon his death, James Lee's land was distributed amongst his heirs, one of which was his youngest son, Russell Lee. Russell Lee donated land to Fairfax County to create the James Lee Elementary School. It's now known as the James Lee Center. The center is also home to the Cultural Resource Management and protection section of Fairfax County. You're gonna learn a lot of interesting history today, so why don't you come on in and enjoy. Welcome to our department. I'm Elizabeth Crowell and I'm the manager of the Cultural Resource Management and Protection Section of the Fairfax County Park Authority and we are responsible for archaeology both on parkland and countywide. Our program has been in existence since 1978 and we represent one of the earliest cultural resource and archaeology programs in the country. Come with me now and let me show you my department. We are downstairs in the wet lab where we wash the artifacts that come in from the field. After they're washed, we put them on drying racks and when they are dry, we bring them upstairs for processing. Mike Johnson, our senior archaeologist, is here in our lab identifying and cataloging artifacts. The artifacts are sorted by type and descriptive information is recorded on the catalog sheets. Artifacts from each location are bagged together. Information about where they are found is labeled on each bag. Our artifact collections at the James Lee Center number more than three million artifacts. Here we have John Rutherford, archaeologist, who's entering artifact information into the computer. Analyzing this information and the findings from the field is like putting together a puzzle. Looking at all the pieces of the puzzle allows us to learn what happened on the site. The artifacts are stored in acid-free boxes with their site information and put in storage for future research or exhibits. Our volunteer extraordinaire, C.K. Gailey, is standing here with one of our exhibits. The journey for each artifact is from the field to the laboratory to analysis. During analysis, we look at the artifacts together with the field information to learn about the past. We share our results in reports, public outreach material like brochures, signs, and exhibits. Another thing we do is we uh, interpret the artifacts. Mm -hmm. You know, that we don't just catalog them, gather them, and, and put them in a box. We try to make sense out of them so that people will understand them. And, you know, for your purposes at the museum, understanding, because that's, that's where the interpretation takes place mm -hmm. in, in museums like that. And what this is, this is a site um, called the Elliott site, which is uh, off Edsel Road in 395. Mm -hmm. We found it in his backyard, in the guy's mm -hmm. backyard. He found it and then reported it to us and we excavated in his backyard. Um, and what we found was a working, a workshop where they were making stone tools. And this is the sequencing after recovering more than 10,000 artifacts of putting it back together, of going from a stage one to stage two to stage three to stage four. In other words, this is the preliminary work, flaking, mm -hmm. then that, 
than that, and you get the final tool over here. Thank you very much, Lynn, and it's wonderful uh, to be able to share this wonderful conference with you this morning. Uh, Lynn has uh, likes <coughs> quotes, and uh, and so while preparing for my remarks this morning, I went online and looked for quotes regarding history. And uh, here's my favorite quote, and this is from John Gardner, and uh, the quote is, history never looks like history when you're living through it. I kind of love that. This is a picture of my great-great-grandfather, James Edward Lee. He was born 1840, and he was born a free mulatto. Now, as a kid, I always knew about James Lee. There was a, a book that was written um, by Mr. Stedman about Falls Church City, and in that book, he references James Lee, and he references my grandfather, who was the, um, um, the, the grandson of James Lee. And I would read these passages in this book, and I'm like, this is so cool to have my family written in a book. You guys have been talking about quotes and lines. So this is uh, my quote, my coin of my phrase. About a year and a half ago, I was, I don't know, one of those evenings when I was drifting off to sleep after doing a lot of uh, computer work, and it just came to me that archaeology releases the past from the purgatory of time. And if you think about that, it's there. You can take the word archaeology and put historical research in that as well. Everything is always there. None of us can make it up if it's really true. But it's the context and how things get put together and presented forward. And that's where you bring it out of the purgatory. It's in limbo. And then when you present that information to the public, then you've rescued it from the purgatory of time. So that's my quote. When we talked about the war between the states of the Civil War, we learned about Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Jeb Stewart, and Abraham Lincoln in that order. She was a great teacher, and she was a great Virginian, and she got me motivated into Virginia history and Civil War history. It's called the Coat of Arms. Have you found the horse thieves who bore your name? And what coat of arms does your family claim? Is it a dangling noose before a calaboose? <laughs> Perhaps this is the only coat you can wear. So with no link to ancient clan or DAR, commemorate those who rode fast and far and ended the race walking on air. Wear a dangling noose before a calaboose. <laughs> For you, no coat that's foreign grown, one made in the USA and your own. These words come from a kindly old wretch known to some as M. Protonius, son of Ench. <laughs> Have a care as you pronounce my pen name, lest my legal ancestry you should defame. <laughs> Speaker Dr. Robert A. Selig received his PhD in history from the University of Würzburg in Germany. His early area of expertise was German American history and the role of Germans in the Revolutionary War. As a specialist on the role of French forces under the Comte de Rochambeau during the American War of Independence, he is the project historian to the National Park Service for the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route. National Historic Trail, just voted a National Historic Trail and signed by President Obama on the 30th of March. The acronym for this is W3R, which you see up there. In this role, he has done historical and architectural site surveys and resource inventories for the states of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. He is currently conducting a Revolutionary Road and Transportation Survey in Virginia funded by the Virginia Department of Historic Resources and more than a dozen local jurisdictions, including Fairfax County. Dr. Selig's extraordinary documentary research on two continents 
An on-site survey has rewritten the understanding of the march to Yorktown and Revolutionary War history in the jurisdictions he has studied. And if you know the route and you follow the route signs on the highways, you're going to be very surprised by some of the things that Dr. Salig is going to tell you. Dr. Salig also enjoys participating in and informing Revolutionary War reenactments, and he and his family live in Holland, Michigan. And we're very fortunate today to also have his daughter Mary in our audience because she's currently living here. Mary, you want to raise your hand? Back there in the back. <laughs> and with that, I introduce to you Dr. Salig. <laughs> start out with notes and then after a while I do free floating. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here and to be allowed to speak after these four gentlemen who were up here before that and to, uh, I, to talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the campaign of 1781 in Northern Virginia. Now uh, when, uh, if you look at your, that the introductory sheet and the information that's in there, you will see there's a sentence that says that in the course of his work he has made many amazing discoveries, discoveries of the true history of the march which passed through Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax, and Prince William counties en route to victory at Yorktown. And the biggest discovery probably that I made of the true history was that in September 1781, no one marched through Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax, and <laughs> Prince William counties en route to victory at Yorktown. So thank you very much. Uh, also a brief lecture, right? Time to go home. Well, not quite. Of course not. Uh, because such, just because nobody marched to Yorktown in September of 1781, of course, doesn't mean that the roads of Northern Virginia weren't very busy in September of 1781 because as a matter of fact, they were. Hundreds of men, hundreds of people, and thousands, literally thousands of animals used the roads of these four jurisdictions of Northern Virginia in 1781, in September 1781, and thousands more used them again in November 1781, in July of 1782 as well. An account of this Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route National Historic Trails project, and now you understand why people call it W3R, you have to take a deep breath before you say it. An account of this, or better, a Revolutionary War Road and Transportation Survey in the Commonwealth of Virginia that is tracing the movements of continental, of, of French, of Crown forces in 1781 and 1782 could begin something like this. Coming from Baltimore, General George Washington crossed the Potomac on Joshua George's ferry. And the ferry crossing that lasted about, about 20 minutes. And late in the afternoon of the 9th of September, 1781, rode on to his home at Mount Vernon. And this is the gentleman, uh, obviously. This is a uh, 1790s map of the area. Here is Mount Vernon, obviously. Here is the road that Washington would have come on. And this here is the spot where this picture was taken. In other words, this is how Washington would have seen, uh, would have seen Mount Vernon. And one of the things that I do in my free time is doing Revolutionary War uh, reenactments together with my other daughter, and two or three years ago, we had the privilege of action encampment right here in front of Mount Vernon, and that was quite an experience to be encamped on a Revolutionary War uniform uh, uh, at this very historic site. The date, I said, is the 9th of September, and among the discoveries or the realizations that I had as I moved from Rhode Island in my research down here to Virginia, that one of the discoveries that I had in realizations was how compressed events are in September of 1781. This is the 9th of September. The siege starts when? The 28th. This is 19 days in between. 
the Yorktown campaign is run with no day to spare. The Yorktown campaign is run on a wing and a prayer. And I and and it dawned on me, or rather it reinforced in me this 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 almost admiration for, for Washington, the fact that the, the amount of faith he must have had that everything was going to work out, that certain things you can control, certain things you cannot control, and eventually uh, things will work out by providence or whatever name Washington would have given uh, the person in charge. On the 10th of September, uh, Jean-Baptiste de Vimeur, the Conde de Rochambeau, who we see here, who is about five years older than Washington, he's born in 1725. Rochambeau joined Washington at Mount Vernon. Another day later, on the 11th of September, the Chevalier de Châtelieu arrives there with his retinue, including some engineers. General Hand is there. By the 12th of September, they continue their journey which took them to Williamsburg on the 14th of September. The siege starts on the 28th. Washington is in Williamsburg on the 14th. On the 15th of September, on the evening of the 15th, about 300 Hussars of Lausanne's Legion with their approximately 700 horses and 35 to 40 wagons reached Georgetown and crossed the Potomac there. The Hussars of Lausanne's Legion that cross on the 15th of September are the advance of the, of the forces who are supposed to lay siege to Lord Cornwallis. They are the cavalry, the advance. Where's the Continental Army on the 14th? and the 15th of September. And where's the French army? Where are Rochambeau's troops on the 14th and the 15th of September? Well, early in the morning of the 11th, we go back two more days, three more days, most of the Continental Army under Washington's command, about 1,800 officers and enlisted men, had sailed from Head of Elk at the very tip of the Chesapeake Bay and uh, the, this, this Continental Army forces are accompanied by uh, four companies of grenadiers, four companies of chasseurs, and about 300 men light infantry, about 1,200 men French forces. On the 12th, 13th, 14th of September, these forces are in the harbor of Annapolis, and they are not moving until the morning of the 15th. Washington is already in Williamsburg, they finally continue their journey. On this letter by Henry Lee, who's county lieutenant of Prince William County, who writes to Governor Thomas Nelson on the 27th of September, 1781, that based on a meeting with Washington in Dumfries on the 12th, and we know that Washington is in Dumfries on the 12th because that's when he gets this note of this, of this naval engagement, the Battle of the Capes, that uh, that he has been instructed to, to examine the fort of Occoquan at a place called Wolf Run Fort, and if it was possible to make the hills there, which were by nature inaccessible, away for wagon to have it done in consequence, etc. This is a letter of the 17th of September. He says it will be done in a few days. Well, that's impossible for the Hussars to take, even if they wanted to because it would not have been ready, and it's impossible for the American wagon train to take on the 21st of September because it wouldn't have been ready yet. But the French wagons come on the 27th of September. And the official French itinerary reads, before entering the town of Colchester from their camp at Child's Run, which is where they are encamped, you take a road to the right that follows the north bank of the Occoquan. A good road leads to the fort, which is narrow and very good. Distance, seven miles. It's exactly seven miles from Child's Run to Wolf Run Shoal, the way the crow flies, but not the way an ox 
heart would go because you have to go to Colchester and then up along the creek. Your itinerary continues after fording the Occoquan. You go down the creek again by the road leading to the forges, one mile. You proceed from the forges to the furnaces, half a mile, and from the furnaces to Marumsko Creek, two and a half miles. In other words, on the other side of the creek, it's exactly four miles from the fort to the encampment on Marumsko Creek. And the encampment was uh, at the intersection of Woodbridge, Occoquan Road, along East Street, down in Wood Woodbridge. If you look at the map at Wolfram Shoals, it is much more than four miles, obviously, from, uh, from Wolfram Shoals down to the encampment at, at, uh, Marums at Marumsko Creek. Now, it's, it's more like 10 miles literally because we've driven it. So we don't have an eyewitness account by a wagoner with the French army, but we know that Berthier, the gentleman I just mentioned who wrote up the itinerary, traveled a single day, <laughs> one day ahead of the wagon train. And in the evening, he wrote up his observations, left them at the tavern where he had spent the night to, uh, for the wagon train to find the instructions on the following day to follow. Surely, if he had wanted them to go like 12 miles rather than seven miles, he would have said so. Nine miles out of the way doesn't seem too much, that much for us today, but in the 18th century, that's a day's march. The Continental Army, French forces marched 10 to 12 miles a day. That is it. So if it's not Wolfram Schultz, which fort did they use? Next slide, please. And here again is a French map. It says to the fort four miles from Colchester, and it is more than four miles from there, from the ferry to Wolfram Schultz. So which fort did they use? My guess would be that they used here, Snyder's Fort. Snyder's Fort. My little arrows are still on there? No. No. Uh, I lost my arrows. Okay. And then arrows on there. Coming, here's the road, right? You go up here past Seligman's, Cross here at Snyder's Fort, come down here to the Occoquan. Here's the Marumsco Creek. You encamp and follow the road here. This is a you know 17 uh, a Civil War map. Again, here up, you come down here and camp and go go that that away. Uh, not only does that meet the mileage requirements, but we even have a Civil War map that says for that Washington crosses with the army to Yorktown. The shoals are up here. Wolfram Shoals up here. This is an 1866 something like map. It's not dated from the Library of the Library of Congress. So I am inclined to argue that in September 1781, no one used the fort at Wolf Run, but. Uh, that doesn't mean that nobody uses the, I'm running out of time, uh, is another detail of this map, but that doesn't mean that nobody uses the, uh, the encampment at the, the road across Wolfram Shoals, because on the way back in 1782, we have the itinerary of Lausanne's Legion, which says that on the 12th of July, from its camp at, camp at Dumfries, the Lausanne's Legion moves to Colchester. The wagons go to a cross, the wagons go to cross at a fort seven miles above the village. That gets you to Wolf Run Shores, which to me all again is an indication that you can actually trust these itineraries because they say four miles. When it's four miles, they say seven miles. When it is seven miles. Now let me uh, let me uh, conclude now. Uh, because you're all uh, getting anxious for lunch, I'm sure. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the encampment site in Alexandria, which I think why it's not where it is. Let me conclude. In 1781, in September, the roads of Alexandria, the roads of Fairfax County, were busy with hundreds of animals and with thousands of animals and hundreds of people crossing uh, these streets. Historical research is 
detective work. It's using primary sources, it's adding mileage <coughs> up, it is using common sense to come to your conclusion. With the specter out there, but if someday you may find a document which will prove you totally wrong because all your guessing was wrong uh, after all. But we try to present as historians what we think at the time is the best possible solutions. Northern Virginia, this area here, that just showed you some examples of what, what I've been doing, is one of the most challenging air, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles on this whole road that I have done over the last eight or 10 years. And I hope that uh, that this research that I have done will help a little bit, not just um, for local history, once my report is released by the Virginia Department of Historic Resources and they are reviewing it right now, uh, not just for, for this National Historic Trail that is gonna be going through this area, but for local history and local research as well. And I thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Good afternoon, I wanna welcome you to the fifth annual Fairfax County History Conference. Fairfax, this is your county. I'm Lynn Garvey Hodge from the Springfield District. I live in historic Clifton, and I'd like you to meet the committee that put this conference together this year. Uh, and I will pass the microphone to. I'm Barbara Nafe, I'm on the commission, and I represent the Hunter Mill District. I'm Carol Herrick, I represent the Drainsville District. Sally Lyons, I represent the Mount Vernon District in the town of Colchester. Ann Barnes, I also represent the Mount Vernon District. Hi, I'm Naomi Zeven on the commission and I represent Mason District. I'm Michael Irwin and I represent Providence District. Hello, I'm Irma Clifton, I represent Mount Vernon District and I'm the treasurer of the uh, Fairfax County History Commission writing the checks for all of these activities today. I'm Mary Lipsy and I represent the Braddock District. I'm Liz Crowell and I'm the manager of the Cultural Resource Management and Protection Section of the Fairfax County Park Authority. And I'm Esther McCullough and I represent Sully District. And I'd like for you to, read, to meet the rest of our commissioners that are with us today. Hi, my name is Debbie Robison. I represent the Sully District on the History Commission and I'm the chairman. And I certainly hope that you'll come back and join us next year.